Find us on Patreon or become a member of the Lost History Channel and show your support to the channel that refuses to go away. Wait till you hear this. We look to the stars and we know we are not alone in the universe. And we know this because we are told that billions of stars in the randomness of space must have their own planets suspended in a sunbeam, just like we are. Billions of the billions of stars with trillions of planets tells us that more than us must exist. Anything less than knowing we are not alone is unfathomable to most, but remember, we are the universe. The search to find an intelligence in a universe similar to our own came into popular thinking around the time of Nikola Tesla, and in the 1940s the phenomena exploded in the wake of World War II and is still continuing into our time. In 1960, the leading scientists by that time, Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Cocconi, and they wrote an article in the British journal Nature about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and in that article they had mentioned that we should be listening to certain radio frequencies to intercept messages that might be arrived from somewhere else other than the Earth. And they concluded that the extraterrestrials must exist somewhere in the universe, and we will be able to see them and communicate with them one day in the not too distant future. By the same time, two stars named Tau Ceti and Epsilon Iridani were pointed out by Frank Drake, an astronomer in Virginia, and they were about 12 light years away from the Earth. Following the American scientists, Russian scientists too tried their part, and on the 12th of April 1965, they received a strong radio signal with high intensity, but later discovered that they were emanating from the quasars in the distant galaxies. Many scientists are unfavoured to the extraterrestrial search because they have so many doubts, and how can a scientific mind not believe that life is a common thing in the universe? And why do they contend that we humans are a random occurrence that cannot be copied? Kenneth Arnold was an American aviator and businessman, best known for the first widely reported unidentified flying object report in the United States, and he had claimed that he had seen around nine unusual objects flying in a chain-like formation on June 24, 1947, near Mount Rainier in Washington. The Kenneth Arnold UFO sighting took place when a private pilot envisaged a string of nine shiny unidentified flying objects flying at speeds that he estimated being at over 1,200 miles per hour. And to the world at the time of this sighting, this was the first post-war glimpse into the United States, which garnered news coverage nationwide and is credited to be the first of the modern era of UFO sightings which included various reported sites for over the next two to three weeks. Arnold's description of these objects resulted in the press considering the term flying saucer and flying disc as a popular descriptive term for UFOs. On that day of June the 24th, it is said that Arnold had been flying on a business trip from Chehalis to Yakima in Washington, in a Call Air A2 and had made a brief detour on learning of a $5,000 reward for the discovery of a US Marine Corps C-46 transport airplane which had crashed near Mount Rainier. The pilot recalls how the skies were quite clear with a mild wind when a few minutes before 3pm at around 9,200 feet in altitude near Mineral, Washington, he finally gave up his search and headed eastward towards Yakima. It was then that he spotted bright flashing light similar to sunlight reflecting from a mirror. Being afraid that he may have been dangerously close to another aircraft, he scanned the skies around but could only see a Douglas DC-4 towards his left and behind him, around 15 miles away. About 30 seconds after seeing the first flash of light, Arnold then saw a series of bright flashes towards his left in the far distance or north of Mount Rainier, which was about 25 miles away. He rocked his plane from side to side to make sure that these could not be reflections. He removed his eyeglasses and later he rolled down his side window so that he could rule this out. He said that it was while I was searching for this crash that I noticed a terrific blue flash past the nose of my airplane. I noticed that the flash came from a train of very peculiar looking objects that were rapidly approaching Mount Rainier at about 107 degrees. And this train of objects were nine in number, and he goes on to say that, I assumed at the time they were a new formation 
or a new type of jet. Although I was baffled by the fact that they did not have any tails, and they passed almost directly in front of me, but at a distance of about 23 miles, which can be considered a close encounter in the air. I had judged their wingspan to be at least 100 feet across, and this sighting did not particularly disturb me at this time, except for the fact I had never seen these planes of that type before. He describes his encounter as follows. These objects more or less fluttered like they were, oh, I'd say, boats on very rough water or very rough air of some type. I'd say they flew like you'd take a saucer and then throw it across the water. Most of the newspapers misunderstood and misquoted me in that too. They said that I said they were saucer-like, but I said they flew in a saucer-like fashion. The reflections were from the flying objects, which flew in a long chain, and for a moment, he speculated them to be a flock of geese, though this too was ruled out due to the altitude, bright glint, as well as the fast speed. He had then considered it to be a new kind of a jet, and took a keen interest for more details on these mysterious objects. He later identified the source of the flashes, which were a series of fast-moving objects, and he described them as silvery and shiny. The most amazing aspect of these objects were the absence of a tail that appeared like a pie plate, which meant that the objects seem to have a raised top on them, and are closely fitting with that of the large UFO photographed at the time of the Battle of Los Angeles. And even though, in a 1930s UFO report in Texas, the term saucer was used, it was actually meant to indicate the relative size of the object from arm's length, and Arnold had informed that the objects moved like saucers when skipped across the water. He indicated how the objects bounce across the atmosphere, and not the shape of the object, but it was reported by Bill Bequetti's report on the Associated Press Newswire as Flying Saucer. To describe the object's shape, a phrase which was coined at the time from these observations, and eventually by the entire nation. But what do you guys think about this anyway? Comments below, and as always, thank you for watching.